The people that design social media and games, they know what they're doing. This is a huge experiment. This is the first generation of human beings ever who we're doing this with. We have no idea really what the long-term implications are. We get a little squirt of feel-good hormones every time mm. we get a new stimuli. What is the danger of comfort and what is the potential solution? Comfort, in a sense, is the opposite of anti-fragility. So anti-fragility, it's the idea that you get stronger as a result of challenge. Our vagus nerve is, um, you know, four or five hundred million years old, whereas our human brain is only about a million years old. So our body and our nervous system, our autonomic nervous system, responds to these cues of noise and sound in a profound way that we don't even know or can't interpret with our human brain. Stefan, welcome to the podcast. Uh, great to be here. We're talking about a device today that I came across. Uh, Lauren actually found it, so I got to give credit to Lauren from our team. This mm -hmm. little stone, this stone that sings, is called Sensate. And you're the CEO, the founder, you're an integrative physician, you've been in healthcare for quite some time. There's a lot to discuss. I think about these external mirrors of mindfulness that all of us have in life. You know, we all know about like the Fitbits and the Aura Rings and all these things. But this is really different. And I think a good jumping off point for us would be talking about the vibration and the harmonics of sound and the difference between vagal stimulation through the ear and actual toning where we're getting it through a different medium. Let's start there for all the science people like you and I, the, the left brain people, the ones that tend to get stuck in our mind that are probably a good fit for Sensate. Let's start at that place and then we'll go into your story after that. But what's the difference between like the stimulation and the toning? Because I think people get those confused. Yeah, I think it's an important distinction. Just to, to mention as well, my co-founder, Anna Goodmanson is CEO. Uh, I'm the inventor and the kind of the, the CSO of the company. Shout out to Anna. I, uh, but I did. I, it, it came from a clinical background. I was using sound frequencies with many, many patients in clinic, and this was the uh, the version that derived from that. I mean, we do make quite a clear distinction between uh, toning and stimulating. So uh, toning implies the ability of, 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 a, of a, a, a tissue to respond uh, in a flexible um, manner, so to upregulate or downregulate, whereas stimulation uh, implies that you are just uh, asking something to perform a very specific function to contract, if you like. So vagus nerve stimulating technologies tend to be uh, invariably uh, electronic devices. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So kind of like pacemakers, there you know you have in the surgical ones that are inserted and then clamped onto the vagus nerve. You have uh, kind of muscle stimulating, almost like tens machine type vagus nerve stimulating devices, which go over a part of the body where the vagus nerve travels, like in the ear or in the neck, uh, and they are using essentially um, electrical stimulation to uh, to flash signals into the vagus nerve. Um, the, the, so in, in not unlike um, getting a, a frog's leg to twitch, if you like, or getting a muscle to twitch by passing electrical current through it. Mm. The, um, the potential issue with that for me is that um, you can, if you can stimulate something, you can easy, relatively easily overstimulate it. Um, and you do, you know, there are cases of people who have had uh, vagus nerve overstimulation. They can become overactivated, uh, anxious, uh, they can have insomnia, et cetera, or have palpitations. Um, this isn't something we really see with what we call toning. So, um, you know, if you're a bit like using breath work, uh, yeah. your own body is regulating the input. So it's quite, you know, you can hyperventilate, of course, um, using breath weight. You can force yourself to, to over breathe. Some people do. Uh, but if, yeah. if you're, you know, if you're using your own body to pendulate the experience, it's relatively hard to overstimulate yourself. And I loved your description of Sensei as a, as a singing stone. Um, uh, one of the arch, uh, ex arch druids in, in, in the UK here um, refers to it as a singing stone, which I think is a lovely um, description of the product, actually. Yes. And, and in many ways, that's exactly right. Uh, what Sensate is doing is kind of accessing, activating these sort of things, the kind of things that human beings have done for themselves for tens of thousands, maybe longer years, you know, where they've sung, they've chanted, they've breathed, they've hummed, they've exercised, they've yeah. gathered around a fire and chanted together uh, and created frequencies in the chest, which are then amplified through um, the, the hollow air spaces in the chest. So you get this, this vibration, this intensity throughout the entire body. What is the main difference between the 
area where we actually would place the device. I was telling you before we recorded, I, I love mm. this little adjustment piece here because I have mm -hmm. a longer torso. And mm -hmm. so for those of us out there that, you know, maybe we have like a longer torso or we need to adjust, but does the location of the stone and the frequency, does it matter? Because when I used it this morning compared to other times, I never adjusted it until this morning. And when I put it right here, right where my thymus is, I noticed it was much more relaxing. Like I feel pretty good. I feel pretty dang good this morning. So yeah, I mean, does location we do, matter? Location, of course, matters. Location, location, location. But uh, you've also got quite a big target area. I mean, most people's sternum is, you know, at least three, four inches. And some people have a very long sternum. Like clearly you have like a 12 inch sternum or thereabouts, you know, the, 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 the bone at the front. So it does have to go at the bone at the front. It does have to go on the center line. You don't want it right up on the neck. You don't want it on the abdomen. Um, but between there, you've got quite a few areas that you can use. Uh, in, in the center, which is an acupuncture point, it's the chakra point, it's where the thymus is, as you say. So right in the center of the chest, between the nipples, uh, is, is the classical location for using Sensate. Okay. The thymus is behind that. The vagus nerve runs behind the breastbone there all the way down. So it's very um, easy to activate uh, the um, vagus nerve and the, the autonomic nervous system in general, not particularly with electrical stimulation at that point, but with sound, sound and vibration, mm -hmm. you know, like thymus tapping as well as a similar kind of process. You had mentioned that we've been doing this for thousands and thousands of years, the vibration, the singing through the voice box. And through some of my research and, and mentorship, I found that, you know, and maybe you can speak to this more as a physician, the body is 90% ish water. So if we are receiving vibration or frequency, which if you look at te Tesla's work, that's all we are. You and I are buzzing right now. That's why we're able to connect. That's why we're able to actually talk through a computer and connect halfway across the world. But if we look at the element of how much water is in our system and how much sound and frequency affects that water, is it really just a question of what frequency am I receiving and how do I receive that frequency? Can you talk about the physiology and the science of how my water and my system actually receives this vibration? Yeah, I mean, it's it's such an important question. So our bodies are between 76 and 96, I think it is percent water, They var it varies a little bit, but very, very high water percentage, absolutely. Um, and speed of sound in water is one of the fastest things. Uh, and this is what I find so fascinating about this field. So uh, nerve conduction um, speed is about 315 meters a second, which is very, very you know, fast to yeah. get from your fingertip to your brain. Um, but speed of sound in water is about 1,500 meters per second. So um, in other words, uh, when you're using Sensate or humming or omming or some kind of similar resonant feedback mechanism, your body is perceiving that before your nervous system tells it is. Mm. which is, I think, fascinating. So it's this incredibly fast, very thorough propagation of frequency and sound through the entire body. You know, whales can hear um, sounds at uh, uh, something like 16 kilometers. So, you know, um, sound propagates incredibly well through water, through solid substances, because the molecules are touching each other. Uh, and that includes your body. Um, so one of the things my, um, my my clinic, New Medicine Group in London, uh, pioneered was the use and the understanding of fascia as a, as a sense organ. So, the, you know, about, about 15, 20 years ago, people we start, people started re-evaluating connective tissue in the body. Uh, and that's become more and more the case. <clears throat> uh, and connective tissue is essentially water in a bound thixotropic state. So it's like, it's, it's, it's you know, it's water in this this um, this fascial connective tissue network, um, a lot of research indicates it's probably where the acupuncture channels are. Mm. It seems to be where a lot of the functions that we thought muscles did is a are actually done by fascia and connective tissue. Um, it's where proprioception happens. Um, it's probably where a lot of traumatic memory is kept. So this kind of this water based medium, which travels everywhere in the body, uh, is also a beautiful pathway, a beautiful channel, literally a channel, a water channel for sound pulsing through the body. Wow, that is fascinating, the speed through water. It made me think of the ocean, you know, and all the creatures in mm -hmm. the ocean, how mm -hmm. dolphins and different, you know, mammals, they, they communicate through sound and sound travels so much faster in water. I just never thought of that. And I think about what you've listed too in some of the research on your side about this infrasonic resonance. So infrasonic meaning what? What exactly is that? So most people know ultrasound, 
Yes. Yeah. So the high end ultrasound or infrared. Um, the the other end of the spectrum is infrasound and ultraviolet. Yeah. So yeah. So co- color and 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 sound. Uh, as you were mentioning, you know, these, these are all just number. These are all just frequency. They're all essentially the same. I mean, we can get into some really esoteric, esoteric territory and, we can and go there. point out we can go that, there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, you know, there's no, neurologically, color doesn't exist. Um, you know, and our perception of reality is based on a lot um, the, the use of the default mode network in the brain. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to walk down the street with any great ease. Um, and human beings also have, you know, done many practices over the years to change the relationship with the default mode network, so we can, you know, see through the veils, if you like, if you want to put it that way. Yes. But um, sound and color are really just frequencies. They're really exactly the same. There's, there's very little difference. Um, and as I say, infrared uh, and, and ultraviolet, uh, and ultrasound and uh, infrasound. So, um, so uh, infrasound is the low frequencies. Yeah, it's the it's the it's um, below roughly thirty hertz. It's kind of mains hum and below. Um, and as you say, a lot of animals in the sea communicate via infrasound. But actually, a lot of animals, the big ones, the ungulates, the elephants, the hippos, communicate via infrasound on land. So they can send messages uh, and they, they can feel and hear through their feet, a lot of the big animals. So they're, they're actually communicating through um, propagation of sound waves, infrasound, low frequency sound waves uh, on the land. Um, and there's been a lot of um, much more research, for, fortunately or unfortunately, into, um, uh, infras- into ultrasound. Yeah, for medically, but also for, you know, cleaning things and all kinds of properties. Much less research on on low frequency sound. Mm-hmm. But we all know, you know, we all know low low frequency sound, right? It's the it's it's the reason we stand near a bass speaker in a reggae concert or whatever, right? You know, or sit or, or you know, it's, it's it's how we feel uh, a sense of awe and wonder in many ways in a spiritual environment. So a lot of uh, there's a, there's a concept called archaeoacoustics, which is the study of sound in uh, traditional spaces. And what seems to be the case in archaeoacoustic, including Stonehenge uh, material, is that they were optimized for the transmission of low frequency sound. A big part of this for me, I'm visualizing too at my mentor's house once, Paul's house, we had some sand and he was singing through a microphone and there was sand that was forming shapes on a vibrational plate. Is that the same type of energy pathway for sound we're talking about here? Or is it something different? Yeah, that's something called cymatics. Yes, um, so it's the visualization of sound using, in this case, sand. You can use it with oil. Uh, there's various ways in which you can do it. And um, again, I, w- I would say it's, a, it's about numbers and frequency. So, uh, you know, a D minor has a particular shape. It will always have that shape. You, know, you play under the same circumstances. Yeah. How you use that information, you know, is, is interesting. But sound has shape, yes. And you can make, you know, they're, they're now making things like objects levitate using ultrasound, yeah. uh, et cetera. So, yeah, there are a lot, a lot of interesting applications to, to, to visualizing sound. You seem like a very spiritual man. The conversations we've had, you've mentioned Chinese medicine. You've mentioned things that, you know, a traditional, I guess you could say, Western American physician might not talk about. Is that potentially why you made the transition with Sensei? Like, in other words, what were you not able to share with your patients? And what did you want from a clinical perspective using this technology, using esoteric knowledge, using your knowledge of spirit and science? What were you not able to do then that you can do now? Well, New Medicine Group was always about challenging the idea that certain practices are our alternatives. So we, we, we always said we don't practice alternative medicine. Uh, we practice integrated medicine. So we will use complementary medicine alongside mainstream uh, testing uh, and drugs, uh, surgery where necessary. You know, we, for me, it's about what works. Uh, and what's best for any particular condition, but, but that that's a particular skill set of knowing what the answers to that is. There are you know fantastic opportunities within science based medicine, um, but there are also fantastic opportunities within traditional knowledge. You know, we have uh, a quarter of a million years, let's say, of traditional knowledge, um, and it would be crazy to not. Um, uh, access that for the benefit of humans, for sure. the benefit of mankind. So, so, so my my thing has always been about okay, what 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 works, what's safe, um, what heals people in the most effective way, and you know, given that um, uh, certainly one of probably the biggest factor uh, with um, illness and feeling 
um, bad at the moment is people's stress levels. Yeah, they're kind of over adrenalized. Uh, everyone's overstimulated. Um, you know, trauma uh, with a small T is almost endemic. Uh, you know, most people aren't sleeping properly. Um, the, the, these sort of issues of overstimulation due to too much um, content, yeah, too too much information coming in, but also the nature of the content about um, you know the end of the world and it, and you should be stressed and sure. you should be worried and you've got to work. Food shortages, finance, education, everything's melting down. It's like, is it really? We have to be careful what we take in. <laughs> Well, certainly we have to have resilience and we have to have uh, what I call uh, what, what's known as anti-fragility, um, which is uh, a step up, if you like, from resilience, because it can only apply to biological mechanisms. Yeah. So it's particularly important for humans and for nature and for plants. But I suppose overall, my view is that um, what we've over the last thousand years, let's say, um, which is quite a small part of uh, even human history, we've tended to put man at the top of this pyramid. Um, and we've tend to, we've tended to make this assumption that human you know the nature is there the world is there to serve mankind mankind's the master at the top of this pyramid and I think you know we're, we're now seeing the consequences of that you know by having this idea that you can take whatever you want um, when you want it uh, without giving back yeah you know, without any sense of reciprocity uh, then you start to run out and you start to cause problems. And that's very much what we're seeing now. So, you know, the indigenous way of peoples all over the world until relatively recently was to have this attitude of reciprocity. If you take something, you give back. You give back at least as much as you take, and then it's sustainable. And I, so I think, you know, I strongly believe that we're going to have to move back to something um, that has those kind of values. Yeah. Um, where, you know, you, it, it, it is about literally about give and take. Um, being you know, being generous, being kind, being understanding, and uh, only utilizing what we actually need. And the challenge there, though, is that you know we've become used to this extraordinary level of comfort. Um, and you can't. And the thing about comfort, of course, is you can't have too much of it. Nobody has ever been made more comfortable than they want to be. You know, it's it's a bottomless need. Mm -hmm. You know, you get you get that big bed, but you let, you then want a bigger bed or a bigger house or a bigger car or you know, there's always more you can have, right? Yes. And we can't, you know, we can't <laughs> um, from a uh, from a human perspective, we can't continue doing that. But also from a personal perspective, doing that makes us um, vulnerable uh, in the in, a, in and not in a good way. How so? How yeah. does it make us vulnerable? Because I'm thinking about the the mechanism in the brain, the limbic system, where we're constantly craving novelty. And how that ties into our reward circuitry in the brain. I, I wonder how you'd explain the danger of comfort and potentially the solution for too much comfort. Yeah, well, there's the, the dopamine driven response um, uh, to of reward, as you say, which is, again, you can never have too much dopamine. So you're always pushing that button. Hence the cell phone where it's constant various novelty at all times, which is why we're drawn to it so much. And the, you know these designers are really, really good. The people that design, um, you know, the social media and games, they know what they're doing. Yes. And you know, I have a couple of young kids. You know, you really see it with kids in particular, even more than with adults. I'm waiting. My son, my son is 15 months old. He's not going to have a phone for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think I said that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I said that, and then they get to twelve or whatever, and it does become it becomes hard. It genuinely yes. becomes hard. It's a, you know, th this is a this is a huge experiment. This is the first generation of human beings ever who we're doing this with. We have no idea, really. Well, I think we do have some idea what the long term implications. We are. can already feel it, though. I mean, we can already see if you look at some of the research around our attention spans, how our attention spans have dropped. Because I want to circle back to that question. If we have this limbic system, it's driven for vari variable reward. We get a little squirt of feel good hormones every time mm. we get a new stimuli. What is the danger of comfort and what is the potential solution? Yeah. Uh, so this is why I talk about anti fragility. Um, so people know about resilience and resilience is great. Um, well, it can be great as long if it's done in a kind of non-macho way. Uh, it's not about survival. It's not about how much pain, how much, you know, discomfort can I tolerate? Because that, that doesn't necessarily build up resilience. It just builds up, <laughs> you know, how thick your skin is. Sure. So anti-fragility is a concept that only applies to biological mechanisms. It's the idea that you get stronger uh, as a result of challenge. So you, you, you can't build that into a machine, right? You can build a machine which is incredibly resilient, but eventually it's going to break. 
Whereas a, a biological mechanism, a plant, a, an animal, a human being, um, if uh, they live in harmony, let's say, with um, their surroundings and the challenge at any one time isn't overwhelming, like nobody's going to be anti-fragile against being hit by a truck, um, then, you know, you can bounce back and actually you end up being stronger. Uh, and, I've, and I've seen this in practice many, many times, you know, patients who say, you know, my illness is the best thing that's ever happened to me, people who recover um, uh, and, uh, and are better, uh, stronger, more resilient, more um, balanced physically and mentally afterwards than they were before. Comfort, in a sense, is the opposite of, of anti-fragility. That, for me, is what I've um, worked out, and that's the problem. The more comfortable you are, the harder it is to be anti-fragile. You know, if you've got this huge bed and this big duvet and this centrally heated house and, you know, this chauffeur to drive you to work and this, you know, maid to cook your dinner and, you know, all this stuff, you don't have to do anything. Then any level of discomfort is infuriating. I, you know, I, I, I know quite a few very, very rich people, <laughs> you know, some small thing goes wrong in their routine and they're pulling their hair out, you know. So we all, you know, that's the other side of the coin, isn't it? We assume that if we're rich, if we have more, that we're happier despite yeah. the fact that all the evidence shows this isn't true. We know yeah. this. We know this absolutely that this isn't true, but we yes. still presume that for us it will be different. But um, so removing, I'm, I'm a big, big believer in removing comforts uh, systematically from your life. And that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of that in biohacking, right? So, yeah. um, you know, cold exposure, regular cold exposure, um, water exposure is a good thing. Um, I'm, I just did 10 days on Dartmoor in England um, without any technology. And the thing I really noticed was the absence of any battery powered lighting. Mm-hmm. Cause I've done, I've been outside a lot. Right. But I haven't often not had a head torch and um, you know, on a, on a moonless night where you can't see your hand in front of your face and you're in the middle of a moor, it's challenging. That's right. I went on a vision quest this year, my second vision quest, and it mm-hmm. was so dark on one of those nights. Mm-hmm. I could mm-hmm. not see anything, but I could hear yep. animals. And when we vision quest, we fast as well. Because I, yes. I like you, you know, it, it's interesting in this conversation because, you know, you're, you're part and parcel a wellness technology company. So you're using the good side of the sword to give people this mirror of mindfulness so that they can calm down through this vagus nerve. But also, you're going out in nature and do you see what I'm saying? You have this blend of nature of spirit and science with you, which is why I connected with the brand. It's why I really believe in what you're doing. It's not just a technology only company. This is something that's part of a wellness wheel. It's part of a holistic system. What, what are the ways in which we can really, I guess you could say, become anti-fragile and, and how does Sensate wrap into that? Yeah. So, I mean, the fact is most people still live in cities. Um, uh, so how do you expose people to the healing benefits of nature, particularly uh, when they're living in a flat in a city and they m- maybe don't have a, a park, let alone you know countryside to go out into? So there's something called biophilia, which is um, uh, the biophilia hypothesis is worth uh, looking up, which is, you know, and, and there's so much research about this now from Japan and other countries where nature exposure uh, is literally one of the strongest medicines. Ah, uh, Shen Ren Yoku is forest bathing uh, in Japan. Japanese yeah. forest bathing, absolutely. Yes. But of course, you know, there's, there's versions of that in every culture um, sure, sure. going. And so spending time in nature, spending time amongst plants, amongst trees, is one of the most balancing and healing things you can do. And I recommend that people certainly do it every week, do it every day if they can. But we, we there's a lot of, um, we're, we're taking people, holding people's hand and taking them down that path by having uh, nature noises in the tracks. Yeah. Sometimes subliminal, sometimes obvious, bird noises, um, water noises, wind noises, you know, all these things, which, again, you know, remember our vagus nerve is, um, you know, four or five hundred million years old, whereas our human brain is only about a million years old. So our body uh, and our nervous system, our autonomic nervous system responds to these cues of uh, noise and sound in a in a profound way that we don't even know or can't interpret with our human brain. Uh, and of course, there's nothing that can replace this, you know, going for a great, nice big walk in the forest. Um, but that isn't available to most people every day. Uh, so, you know, we're, a big part of the sensei solution is making 
um, the benefits of that available to anyone any day. Yeah. Because you know, the, again, the research is quite clear that just the sounds of nature is you know almost as effective as actually being in nature. And Almost. there's a lot less anxiety, yeah, and a lot, and a lot less, and a lot less anxiety provoking, and a lot easier for most people. Sure, yeah, because I, I really feel like you're speaking to where, unfortunately, the majority of people are is let's say they're working in careers where they're indoors, maybe they're in cubicle and they're getting that LED, the non LED light, like the halogen lights from the top of the ceiling. They're not mm -hmm. getting the natural circadian rhythms awakened in their nervous system. They're not really mm -hmm. living in nature's cue. And so this is the reality of where we are. I don't, I don't think it's, look, every, everybody would wanna have a lifestyle where they could spend seven or eight hours in nature every day. And until that people are afforded that lifestyle, there is some biohacks that can get them as close to it as possible. I, I'm curious how you feel. I feel like with biohacking, really, we had Dave Asprey in the studio behind me here a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, you know, I was thinking with Dave and we were going back and forth on what is biohacking. And I really feel like biohacking is any device or any technology that can get us closer to the natural way that we are afforded to live, that we are supposed to be living. In other words, if it's sun, sleep, breath, food, light, whatever it is, biohacking at its core wants to give us access to the things that nature would give us access to anyways. What is your thoughts on that? I think, I think that, but also the enhanced version of it. You know, biohackers, uh, of course, love to be able to um, supercharge that uh, that that response, you know, yeah. they want, uh, most yeah. of them want to live forever. I mean, most most of the big biohackers are big Sensei fans. So Dave Asprey's talked about it. Ben Greenfield, uh, Timu um, over in Finland, Tim in London, Tim Gray. Um, so yeah, most of these guys, you know, have, have, have use uh, Sensei to on the, um, and they've endorsed it on a regular basis. Yes. Yeah, I think I, I think biohacking, but it's not for everyone, right? Because it takes. Let's be honest, it takes a fair degree of commitment and not to mention money. Uh, in fact, that's an interesting point, you know, the money side. Uh, I mean, obviously Sensei is a private uh, company. Uh, it's a relatively expensive purchase. But um, I think uh, we worked out the other day that if it saves you uh, uh, a year's therapy bills, um, then it comes in at a fraction of the cost of, of you know other interventions that you might do. Yeah. So you know, I, I, I like I do like to think that actually it's a cost saving. Device. I mean, listen, I would challenge you even more. I would say, what about all the ways that people use alcohol and drugs and pornography and shopping and all these things to give themselves that deep breath, the calmness that are very deleterious to their health? It's probably in the thousands of dollars a year, even for a low economic person, that they're spending things to give themselves a really a compelling breath which is essentially what Sensei provides. Yeah, I mean, um, entertainment, the way we, I think it's a bit different in as much as people do things to distract themselves. Um, and that, those are the kind of, you know, when, when you're overwhelmed, the options tend to be either distraction, yeah, through um, sex, exercise, diet, whatever it might be, TV, uh, phone, doom scrolling on your phone, or engaging with it. Uh, through meditation, reflection, journeying, like you've done, and that you know, so that's what one is pretty harmful to your health and not not really a long term solution. Totally fine, yeah, to do a, to do sometimes, you know, watch a watch a film, brilliant, great, lovely, yeah. Um, you know, but again, most people aren't going to um, fast for a month and stick themselves on a on a moor uh, either. Um, so uh, for for me, it's about the numbers. The reason I uh, you know effectively finished um, a very successful. Uh, Harley Street London practice to commit full time to this was I realized that in practice I could see you know tens of thousands of people over the next 30 years um, having spent 30 years seeing people already um, but with Sensei I could impact on the lives of millions of people so that is saying you know my personal vision is to have positively impacted the lives of 100 million people by 2025 um, and our users have now run about 25 million minutes um, uh, at a, and, uh, and we worked out the the, you know, the therapy equivalent of that, and it's you know tens of millions. Um, but also, you know, a good example, for instance, was um, a an American vet, American soldier, um, who, uh, like so many uh, people, unfortunately, in, in in the services, was suffering from PTSD from trauma. Yeah, yeah, and hadn't left the house for five years. 
um, after a week, uh, might have been two weeks of using Sensate. You know, he emailed us. We didn't. You know, we don't. We, people spontaneously contact us quite a lot to say that he'd been out for dinner for the first time with his family of uh, five people for the first time in five years. So I think you know, there's five people right there whose lives were were just that little bit better that day and going forward because he'd been able to access Sensate. That's got to make you feel so good and sleep so good at night. Yeah, you know, I mean, you can't you can't buy that. You know. Yeah. When I get a message from someone about the podcast and sometimes they'll message me on Instagram or they'll send me a message, it's like, that's why we're doing what we do. I understand that we're in a, I believe in conscious capitalism. I understand we're in a capitalistic system and you know, we're all doing our part to play and to, to do the best we can. But at the core of it all, like, why are we even in society? What are we even doing here? If we're not making other people's lives better, because when I make other people's lives better, it enriches my own. It gives me more meaning, more purpose, more zest for being alive myself. So much. I and mean, when we know um, absolutely that simply accumulating objects, including money, doesn't make us happy. We do know absolutely that helping other people does make us happy. Having a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives, knowing that we are valuable to other people, this is what makes us happy. Yeah. I can see that. I can feel that too. And and I want to pull the e-break because there was something I wanted to mention to you that's close to home. And it was actually about King Charles and this anti-fragility piece. Because you mentioned when people have too much comfort, when they're getting too much stimuli, people are in, you know, double king beds, private chef, everything. You know, I don't know in the world if somebody's more taken care of than King Charles. And I remember seeing a clip that we'll post. We'll post it down below wherever you're watching or listening. And he had a pen. He was signing a document with a pen and the pen leaked on his fingers. And he got so angry that he started like almost like a child. He started going, I hate this pen. He was freaking out. And I thought to myself, wow, that's that's a pretty severe reaction to a leaky pen. And I and I wonder if he himself being so comfort and so taken care of, if his fragility has actually become more exposed. What do you make of that? Yeah, well, the, the, <laughs> we could have a whole series devoted to the uh, the foibles of the English upper class uh, and royalty in particular. I mean, in, in a way, it's a, it's, they are very looked after, as you say, but they're also, uh, on the whole, fairly um, uh, emotionally um, blunted by school and upbringing. So it's it's not a I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't for uh, foist that job on anyone to be honest i wouldn't do what to any of them do yeah it's, it's a very very thankless task um you know it's, the privilege doesn't make up for it sure i, I could imagine too because i'm thinking about here in america everyone's goal is to have like the four or five bedroom house with like the boat in the driveway and the all the trappings and all the vacations and everything at what point have you seen either personally or with your company or with patients where the juice isn't really worth the squeeze. In other words, how much comfort do we actually need in this world? And what does that comfort actually look like? Of course, the boss of Patagonia, whose name temporarily escapes me, just gave the company away, right? How many billion it was. I heard about that. But how, you know, once, once you've got a few million, what are you going to do with, yeah. you know? A couple, a couple of billion. You can't, you know, what are you going to do with it, you know? Right. Um, and, and obviously people go through the motions of setting up trusts and various things. Uh, but um, they find it hard, very, very hard. Uh, most people, understandably, find it hard to really hand over control of those assets to somebody. They, you know, they, they tend to want to remain involved in some sense. And then it's not charity. As long, you know, as, long as you have to control it, then it ceases uh, to, to have that kind of role. I mean, I think we can live an incredibly simple life. I think it's hard. To, you can't uninvent anything. So, um, you know, it's a big deal to say I'm going to do without technology, knowing that mobile phones exist. If, if they, you know, if you don't know they exist, it's not hard to do without them, right? Yeah. But we know all this stuff exists, and you can't uninvent it. You know, we know that battery-powered LED lights are really useful, <laughs> Out, you know, outdoors where it's dark. We know that lighters or a lot easier to light a fire with than rubbing st two sticks together. So um, I think there is a natural balance between um, using things that are incredibly useful uh, and then knowing when something doesn't really significantly enhance your happiness, but actually just makes, it's just another thing mm -hmm. in your life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, and if we look at Indigenous peoples around the world, the few that are left, a lot of them live incredibly simple lives. 
Um, and it's interesting reading accounts of, say, Darwin um, uh, when he was visiting some of, you know, some people obviously before uh, Westernism, uh, Western economies, as we know, arrived, uh, and uh, it was literally failing to understand why they didn't want more things. He, you know, they would get the settlers, the early Darwin settlers, would get quite annoyed with some of the natives. They would give them something, and rather than just accumulate more wealth, they would divide it equally between between everyone in the village. Ha! Huh. You know, even like a you know a piece, a piece of clothing, perhaps. And um, you know, his his thought process as a Victorian. Uh, entrepreneur gentleman was well listen if you you know if you accumulate more you can become the chief of this village and then you can uh, dominate the next village so it was a very very different mentality to that everybody is equal mm-hmm. and uh but you know the by all accounts these people were incredibly satisfied and happy it's 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 um you know what the more we build into our lives the idea of what we haven't got the more potential for not being uh, satisfied there is that makes really good sense to me because I'm thinking about at what point is the juice worth the squeeze and everybody's heard of Maslow's triangle and some people agree with it, some don't. But I think once we have our bases covered financially, we have shelter, we have food, we have water, we have breath, we have community, we have conversation, connection. All these things are so important, but I'm really speaking for and to the people that are out there in the world right now that are with us, that are that are listening and watching that might be in a car or stationary or in another business meeting like we've got to give our fellow citizens our global citizens some tools some things that'll really truly help them exactly where they are and i think you know obviously we can go and we can go sing and we can go hum and chant we can get some of the benefits of of this technology of this vibrational technology but you can't sing and dance during a business meeting. <laughs> you know, there's certain practicality that we have to take into account. So what are some of the ways that you've uh, been excited to hear about people using the Sensate that maybe you didn't initially intend? You know, the best things in life really are free. Uh-huh. Br- you know, breathing and loving and caring and being generous uh, with your time. You know, all these things are free. Um but because but that we value them less, therefore, so sometimes we need to find ways to bring them into our life. I mean, thing, uh, things that like, the kind of level of um, spontaneous testimonial that we get is lovely. I mean, genuinely lovely. We touched on this a moment ago as well. Um, we don't, we haven't particularly solicited this from our uh, users, but every day we get people writing in saying you know, this has changed my life. This is, you know, this has made more difference to me than 10 years of medication, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, And although we don't particularly suggest that people use it with children, a lot of people are, it turns out, using it with their children. We don't recommend that. Um, But um, I mean, one of the most heartbreaking things I think that's going on in the world is the epidemic of anxiety in younger people. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very difficult world to grow up in. Um, I think the pandemic uh, really highlighted that even more. There was a whole generation of children who spent, you know, like a year or more uh, at home, you know, were taken away from their friends and their family. Uh, teenagers who were just starting to have relationships were, you know, pulled apart. So I think, I think, uh, uh, and 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 at the same time, technology, you know, the rise of technology um, has um, uh, made meaningful connection harder and harder. I mean, it's made superficial connection easier and easier. But uh, community-based, meaningful connection has become um, a rare and beautiful thing. Mm. And I think the I think the pandemic in general, uh, I think the un, the unexpected consequences are tremendous. So many things that we didn't think were possible, we suddenly realize are, like not going to work every day on a train. Things that three years ago we would have said, "Oh, I can't possibly do that." Yeah. Actually, it turns out you can do that. Um, and that actually you have much more control over your life and how you run it um, than perhaps you thought you did. And a lot, you know, and there's lots of talk about the great resign and, you know, people um, uh, uh, working in new and different ways. And of course, that, a lot of that is technology based. So, as I say, we can't uninvent anything. Nobody's going to uninvent Wi-Fi. Nobody's going to uninvent the smartphone. But let's let's find out how to use them to leverage humanity's development into the next uh, next phase of, of our life on this planet. That's beautiful. And honestly, it's it's a perfect segue to my next question because I was doing research and I was thinking about what is this device really about? If we stripped away, if we stripped away all the science, which, you know, I love science too, 
and we just said, what, what does this wellness tech actually do for somebody at their deepest need? This is about stress resilience. And stress resilience is this body's ability to recognize a challenging situation and then choose something positive in a way to respond to it. And you can measure it through HRV. So we've talked about HRV a lot on the show. Um, I think it's a really great barometer for many things, you know, even um, chronic heart disease and um, immune issues. It's becoming this piece in medicine where people are doctors, physicians are using it on a grand scale. Let's talk about stress resilience for everyone. And how can we use Sensate for our HRV as almost like a feedback loop for wellness, where it's like we have our HRV, we're using the technology to calm ourselves through the frequency, and then also there's a wellness component to all of that, which essentially makes us more anti-fragile, more able to have stress resilience. Let's expand that a little bit. Exactly. I mean, I, I think the primary um, function and outcome of, of using Sensate is to increase connected connection. Yeah, because so much of uh, connection with ourselves and with others is physical rather than um, through um, the brain, actually. It's, you know, so much of our emotional intelligence is in our muscles and particularly in our connective tissue and in our central, our, our autonomic nervous system. You know, the higher stuff absolutely goes on, the, on in the brain and the neurology is fascinating. But well-being is much more in, in many ways to do with the body than it is to do with the brain. Uh, and which is why, you know, sense it goes on the chest. It's why it vibrates and uh, resonates throughout the body via the autonomic nervous system. It's why we're, it's why we're not a headset, um, you yeah. know, ele ele electrically stimulating the brain. Um, but, you know, we have measured, and um, when I was deciding how effective this technology was, we, we ran uh, tests on hundreds uh, of, uh, of, you know, thousands of, um, of uh, uses uh, of the device um, in clinic uh, on patients, real patients. And particularly, we were measuring a number of biomarkers, particularly heart rate variability, HRV, um, subjective well-being, uh, respiratory capnography, peripheral uh, temp uh, temperature, because that's a great measurement of autonomic uh, down regulation, auto autonomic uh, relaxation. And, you know, it improved. And in fact, Sensei was designed to have a measurable impact within 20 minutes, which is what I thought the kind of time scale would be. It turns out it actually had most of its biometric impact within 10 minutes. So, so that's, that is the use case that we say. We say use it once a day for 10 minutes. And for the vast majority of people, that is measurably effective. Now, we're, a, uh, we're not a medical product. So that was a very specific decision to go down a consumer well-being route rather than a medical device. Because of less regulation? Yeah, well, you, um, I mean, one, um, it probably wouldn't be on the market yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> if we'd gone down that route, you know, several million pounds and, and uh, many trials later. Yeah. And I've seen some great devices disappear into a black hole that way because they get, they go, they jump through all the hoops. And then actually at the end of the day, um, they're not, they're not prescribed by the consultants because they have other solutions, but mostly drug-based solutions that they're already using. So I, I didn't want there to be a layer of complication between the end user uh, who had the symptoms, you know, the consumer who was anxious or overwhelmed uh, and the company. So it's a direct to consumer device, although we are um, do, pursuing higher levels of research at the moment, but we've already shown in clinic that uh, there is a heart rate variability impact uh, within 10 minutes. And for me, actually, more importantly, there's a subjective well-being impact. Um, so subjective well-being is how somebody um, perceives they feel. And that's been shown in research to have a 96% accurate prediction of how long they will live for. Heart rate variability actually is quite similar, but heart rate variability is very sensitive to, you know, you've run up the stairs, you've had a cup of coffee, you've had a bad night's sleep. Dehydration, yeah. Yeah, and you really have to take it over at least a month for it to be of much value, probably longer really, probably three months. Okay. At the biohacker shows, I often get people running up to me and, you know, showing me the app and saying, look, my aura ring is <laughs> telling me this, should I worry? <laughs> um, but, they say, so should that, I that, worry? That, you're like, first of all, stop worrying. <laughs> <laughs> no, you shouldn't worry. It's not productive. Okay. But uh, subject, I love subject, well, subjective well-being because anyone can do it. It's yeah. like, how are you feeling right now in this moment on a scale of naught to six? Um, and that is directly equatable in a linear fashion with how long you live for. Mm. So if some, you know, if you can shift somebody's subjective well-being by 20, 30 percent, which we were uh, more than doing, then you're actually you're literally adding a decade of life. You know, it's, it's, it's major, major stuff. Yes. So, um, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan of heart rate variability. I think it's, 
com- uh, it's more complex than uh, we imagine. Uh, I think it's um, it, where it's currently positioned within the sort of training uh, athlete, uh, elite athlete um, market, I think makes a lot of sense because these are very dedicated people who try and reduce the parameters in their life and they try, they try and get a good night's sleep. They try and eat the same. Yeah. So, you know, using heart rate variability as a predictor of stamina and recovery make, makes a lot of sense. But for, uh, for average people, for a lot of people who lead irregular lives, I think it's a harder metric than some to make sense of but what would be a better what would be a better metric than hr well vagal tone vagal, vagal tone. nerve tone that's see yeah. if that, that that's why we've um highlighted on uh allied on vagal nerve tone because what drives blood pressure what drives um uh heart rate variability uh, what drives how you feel what drives you know gut function you remember, remember the vagus nerve is literally the physical anatomical representation of the gut brain axis um, you know, that is the vagus nerve. So um, if you if you drill down into all these things that we measure, um, what you tend to find basically is vagal nerve tone underlies that capacity. So if you can improve vagal nerve tone, you pretty much are improving everything that you should be interested in. How do we measure vagal nerve tone? How do we do that? Ah, <laughs> now that, that is also complex. Measuring it directly is really quite hard mm-hmm. without putting a lot of very invasive um, equipment on you. So that, um, which of that, of course, will then tend to make people uh, a bit anxious. So it, it becomes quite difficult to measure it in a non, um, you know, clinic based population. But you can measure the uh, the biomarkers. So heart rate variability, you know, is a direct reflection of vagal nerve tone. Uh, heart rate, morning heart rate, uh, uh, peripheral circulation uh, is a measurement of um, uh, autonomic nervous system flexibility. Okay. So, you, you know, if you if you measure breathing rate, um, CO2 levels, all these sort of things, if you measure a number of uh, um, biomarkers which are underpinned by vagal nerve tone, then, then you've got a good idea. That's fascinating to me because I think about the objective well-being of someone, I think collectively or, or, or just seeing like objectively our society, I, I don't know a time where people have been more stressed and more under really an existential threat, but also the world is still a beautiful place. There's still incredible things going on. There's so much to be grateful for. How do you make sense of this as a physician from a spiritual perspective, where we are in society's evolution right now? Is what I, I refer to good uh, stress, clean stress and dirty stress. So um, in, although in many ways the, the world is the safest, cleanest, uh, least famine-prone, least disease-prone it's ever been yeah. in the history of humanity. Um, the on the other hand, we feel the most threatened and and we feel the least safe that we've ever felt. And in terms of the Maslow and the hierarchy of needs, the triangle, um, you know, the bottom line that 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 pyramid rests on is feeling of safety. Because that nothing else matters. You know, forget shelter, forget food. If you don't feel safe then you're unable to settle. And I, from what I've seen in clinic and what I've seen um, in the last few years with Sensate, uh, most people have um, at least some lack of safety in their in their makeup. Yeah, they feel mm-hmm. chased. And this is the problem. It's kind of nameless. You know, when you are actually being chased by a wolf, you know, <laughs> you know what the problem is, right? Yeah. But when you're being chased by emails and texts and WhatsApps and you know a thousand deadlines, it's it, it's it's a it's a dirty stress. It's not a good stress, and actually, and also, also, there's very little you can do about it. Um, you know, we in trauma therapy, uh, Peter Levine's work, um, you see animals in the wild. Uh, they either get eaten or they get away. If they get away, they shake and they pant and they hyperventilate, and then they're fine. So other than animals in the zoo, a very, very different um, thing, but animals in the wild don't get PTSD because they have inbuilt mechanisms to recover and to shake off that trauma. Whereas um, uh, human beings, you know, we don't, uh, we don't, when it's, it's happening to us constantly. So we all have this kind of level of uh, low lying trauma or major uh, traumatic feelings. Um, uh, uh, We're overactivated. Yeah. We're over-adrenalized. And we're overwhelmed. 
I felt more calm as you were discussing that because I thought about I've seen zebras and tigers and I've, I've we've talked about this before on the show the mechanism of our body to actually somatically release the pressure the stress the trauma the tension and what it's been for me has always been and always will be the breath it's why I have my students at breathwork.io it's why I do breathwork myself I mean I did it before we jumped on our podcast because it's a way that I can not just stay connected to myself, but also in your scientific nomenclature, have that tone, actually tone myself. I'm really curious for the future how science might blend with spirituality and the things that we already know are great to do, like breathing, like sun, things like that. What do you think the future holds? What excites you about the future when you look at this frequency, this harmonic therapy and the ways that it can help people be more resilient to stress and just honestly give people a deep breath and people the healing that they need. Like what excites you the most about the future? Yeah, I mean, breath work is incredibly effective. You know, it is our first breath in is the first thing we do. Our last breath out is the last thing we do. Yeah. And yeah. there's a, a relatively infinite number of breaths. That's a wild thought, isn't it? <laughs> It's a crazy thing. That is a wild and, you know, thought. And breathing is breathing's the only autonomic nervous function, nervous system function that we can control. The only lever we can pull, and the it's voluntary and involuntary. It's the only one. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Which is, and that's the point, right? So we, when we get scared, we hold our breath, and then that becomes a pattern in the fascia, in the connective tissue. So you know, the the um, so breathing is is the routine, but it's also the cause of the problem <laughs> in many yeah. circumstances. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I do genuinely think the sound uh, in all its forms, including music, you know, the, the crossover now between uh, music and well being and entertainment is very very um, visible. You know, a lot in you know, most a lot of artists are doing uh, music for sleep, music for well being. Uh, obviously, Apple and Dolby and all these kind of channels are uh, working on content using spatialized sound and other uh, ways of creating higher levels of immersive uh, experience. What's the spatialized sound? What's that? Well, so spatial. So the way, and, and, we're, and we're remixing a lot of our stuff in spatial sound. We're working with a number of spatial artists. So I think of mono as being one dimensional. Stereo is being two dimensional, but still completely artificial. You know, mm -hmm. two two sources of sound, totally artificial. Um, <clears throat> uh, spatialized sound is then like three D. So you're you, you're mixing sound right. and experiencing sound in in three hundred and sixty degrees. Is this where you'd blend that three D experience with isochronic and binaural beat technology? Sort of. So yeah, bi binaural beats are where you have slightly asynchronistic um, uh, sounds in each ear, and it's, yeah. and it harmonizes the two hemispheres of the brain um, and can produce certain brainwave frequencies like alpha, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's, it's more that, say, for instance, you know, if you're in a concert, concert hall and there's a piano player up there, uh, you know, if you turn your head, the piano player doesn't move with you, right? If you're wearing headphones, <laughs> <laughs> the, the entire orchestra moves as you move your head, which is kind of obviously completely unnatural. Yeah. So within, um, but also... You know, if you're walking through a forest, you've got a bird up here, you've got a twig underfoot, you've got a, a river over there. Uh, so much more than simply um, uh, stereo sound. So you can use normal stereo headphones and you can create these 360 degree mixes. And then if you add Sensate to that, that's four dimensional sound. So you've got this bubble of sound all around you plus physical uh, sensation. And at least 50% uh, of you, our experience of sound is body. We tend to think about obviously compressed uh, airwave activity in the ears, which is incredibly important. And it's how we um, hear and perceive nuanced sound. Yeah. But so much of sound is perceived via uh, sound receptors in our body, not in our ears. Mm, so those receptors in our skin and in our organs, they work in tandem with our audio receptors. Exactly. So that's the function, of, again, of the autonomic nervous system is to process the combination of these two. That's what we do with Sensate. We write these pieces of music, which are where the, aud the audible sound is synchronized with the felt sound. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, in England, there's a, lot, there's a lot of very big churches and cathedrals here. And some of the uh, early uh, composers, uh, sacred music composers, but people like Bach and Monteverdi as well, uh, they were composing for the church organ, which its two lowest octaves are infrasound. Yeah, they're below human hearing. So um, 
there's one of the things that uh, is attributed to low frequency sound is a sense of you know, as being the inventor, the originator of, of, of religious experience, ah. uh, of, of, of creating awe and wonder uh, within the body. That kind of that deep, beautiful rumble that you can feel, almost um, like a primordial the, sound, like a ohm. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and you know, I've I've got a guy in one of the churches near me. Uh, one of the cathedrals near me to play some of these lower octaves on the organ, and it is extraordinary. You don't you don't hear anything. You just feel the bu- the building start to. There's an organ pavilion. Um, I was born and raised in San Diego, California. There's an organ pavilion that is. If you ever get the chance, if anybody gets the chance, go listen to it. It's exactly what Stefan's talking about. You'll feel something before you actually hear it. It's like this vibrational kind of like cozy. It's so powerful. It's so beautiful. We've covered a lot. We've covered a lot of ground today, man. I've really enjoyed where we've gone in this conversation. A lot of this stuff I've never thought about. I just quite simply haven't thought about it. So y'all, you need to get this in your life if you're the kind of person that spends a lot of time indoors. I think this is a perfect device for people that want to break in the middle of the day, but maybe can't get outside. And obviously nature is best, but you know, we have technology, which is also nature itself working through us. The link is joshtrent.com forward slash sensate. It'll be linked right there. And you can use the code josh20 for $20 off your order. So thank you for that generosity, Stefan. We appreciate you with all the ground that we've covered. What did we miss? You know, what's part of the conversation about this healing technology that maybe hasn't come to the surface yet in our conversation? Well, Josh, I suspect we could probably talk all day uh, about interesting subjects. There's so much of interest in the world, isn't there? There's I mean, so I, much, I just, yeah. you know, my, my plea is, is, is to each of us as individuals, as human beings, is to do the work. Yeah, do the work on ourselves and start gently yeah don't um you know to build anti-fragility start gently and work up yeah remove very small little comforts and challenge yourself in small ways and be of help to other people yeah that's the number one thing we can all do help others yeah it's a huge part of why i'm doing what i'm doing i remember when i wasn't leading a purpose-based life i had a lot more health issues i had a lot more stress and honestly i just would wake up in the morning and just not feel good about life compared to like how i do now and look the human experience is always unfolding we don't know what the future holds but i really love the way that you put some of the concepts in here connecting us back to nature by using these subtle technologies that can get us more aligned with maybe the way we were designed to be. And maybe it's not even a maybe, I think that it is. So I really appreciate you, man. I really appreciate what you've done to come from a medical background to bring that into this technology sector. How would you, as we say goodbye, how would you define wellness? If you had to put a definition on well-being, how would Stefan define well-being? What is a life well-lived? I, um, I, I think contentedness. I think we elevate happiness when we should elevate contentedness, be things being just fine as they are. That really is what we should all aim for. And why is that? Why contentness instead of happiness? Because um, happiness, like its opposite, can't and probably shouldn't last. Yeah, happiness is a is a, a, a fleeting state. Yes, yes. Uh, whereas contentedness, if you're if you if you simply are content with what you have then you're never unhappy. And there'll be times when you are happy. You can only be unhappy if you think you haven't got something. Words of so wisdom. if you're content by definition, yeah. you don't think you haven't got something. I, th- I think you're right. You know, when I feel into that answer, even the question itself, like well-being isn't supposed to be 100% 24 hours a day happiness. That's just not realistic. Mm-hmm. But yeah. being contentment, there's a space of ease in contentment. And yeah. of course, the opposite of ease is dis-ease. So it's it's very That's beautiful right. the etymology of all these words. I really appreciate. And you wouldn't you. want you know you can't you couldn't live your life in awe all the time, right? Yeah, unless you know maybe maybe you do enough of that you become a transcendent master. But you know, great. But for most of us, <laughs> you can't live in awe, right? Because um, you know you, you you'd forget to eat. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, most of us, good news, most of us are not floating on a cliffside wearing a white cape with a huge jewel around our neck. So I think we're good. Um, yeah. I really appreciate you, as I've said before, coming on the Wellness and Wisdom podcast. We we really think that, you know, we're, we're super you. careful about who we partner with. And uh, it means a lot that you guys are doing what you do in the world. So, you know, you have all of our support and just keep going, man. Keep affecting all these these lives and giving people that deep breath and this connection to their body again that I think is missing for so many. So uh, from my heart to yours, thanks for coming on the show. Direct people where they can go if they want to look at some of the science and the research or just get involved more in the conversation. I know down below here is joshtrent.com forward slash sensate. But um, tell people where they can get involved in the science and some of the other things. Yeah, so getsensate.com is our website. You know, there's a blog there. Uh, which I'm not updating as, as often as I would like, but there's a blog, there's the science, there's obviously um, uh, more about the product on getsensate.com. Great. Stefan, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much. And let's just take a nice breath in and then out through the mouth. <sighs> my favorite. That's my favorite thing to do. Okay, you guys, until we see you again, we're both wishing you love and wellness. We'll talk to you next week. Hey. Thanks for watching the podcast. I appreciate you being here. If you haven't done so already, click the subscribe button and the little notification bell so you never miss any of this free weekly content delivered from my heart with care right to yours. If you love this video, you'll love any of the videos on this page. Just click the one you want to watch next.